Hello, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Now today we shall be discussing the important news appearing in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 8th January 2020. The news to be discussed has been presented on your screen and time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start our today's discussion. The first news appears on page number 2. It says, Model code in place, civic bodies told to enforce provisions. So this news highlights about the election date announced by Election Commission of India with respect to election of Legislative Assembly in Delhi. So in this news analysis, let us understand about model code of conduct as well as certain important features which has been highlighted in this particular news. So, a model code of conduct is a set of guidelines issued by the Election Commission of India and this is done under Article 324 of the Indian Constitution. So, this MCC or model code of conduct is basically a set of guidelines in order to regulate the political parties as well as candidates prior to election and this is done to ensure a free fair as well as a transparent election process. So effectively we can say that the model code of conduct is primarily for guidance of political parties and candidates as a set of norms which have been evolved with the consensus of these political parties who have consented to abide by the principles embodied in the said code and also binds them that is bind the candidates as well as the political parties to respect and observe the model code of conduct in letter and spirit. However, it must be remembered that the model code of conduct does not have any statutory backup or any statutory standing and it is just a mere set of guidelines issued by the election commission and duly abided by the candidates and political parties during the course of election process. Now this topic becomes important from our examination perspective both from prelims and mains point of view. In mains, this topic gets covered under GS paper 2 specifically with respect to conduct of elections. So as you can see, article 324 mentions about superintendents, direction and control of elections to be vested in the election commission of India. So the model code of conduct comes into effect straight away after the announcement of election schedule by the election commission of India. Now this point must be remembered from your Phillips point of view that it comes into effect after the announcement of election schedule by the election commission of India and does not come into effect after the election notification. Now the importance of model code of conduct arises from the fact that it aims to ensure that the ruling party either at the center or in the states does not misuse their official position to gain an unfair advantage in an election. So in this regard, the model code of conduct acts as a guidance for political parties and candidates in the election process. So in this regard, let us go through some of the frequently asked questions on the website of Election Commission of India with respect to the model code of conduct. And then we shall discuss the important features which have been highlighted in this particular news, especially with respect to the conduct of elections in Delhi. So one of the most important question is that from which date the model code of conduct is enforced and operational and up to which date. So as we have already discussed that it comes into effect from the date of announcement of the poll schedule and the MCC is operational till the process of elections are completed. So it basically means at the end of voting on the last voting day as announced by the election commission of India. The next question is. What is applicability of code during elections and by elections? So this model code of conduct is applicable during the elections to house of people that is Lok Sabha. It is applicable during the elections to the legislative assembly as well as during the by elections. So model code of conduct is applicable during the election of Lok Sabha, Vidhan Sabha as well as by elections. It further says that what are the salient features of model code of conduct? It lays down that how political parties, contesting candidates as well as party or parties in power should conduct themselves during the process of elections and this MCC becomes applicable on their general conduct during electioneering 
with respect to their holding meetings and processions, their poll day activities and also with respect to functioning of the party in power when the model code of conduct comes into effect. The next question is whether a minister can combine his official visit with electioneering work. The answer is simple no. The ministers shall not combine their official visit with electioneering work and shall not make use of official machinery or personnel during the electioneering work. So basically, the ministers cannot use public money for their political end. Next, whether government can make transfers and postings of officials who are related to election work. Now, it says that there shall be a total ban on transfer and posting of all officers as well as officials either directly or indirectly connected with the conduct of elections. And in this regard, if any transfer of posting of an officer is considered necessary, then a prior approval of the election commission must be obtained. Now, it is important to note that at times election commission itself also transfers certain officials with respect to the conduct of election. So effectively, it becomes the sole priority of the election commission of India to transfer any official or not in a proposed jurisdiction where election is to be conducted. The next question is, has the model code of conduct been recently amended? The answer is yes, as the election commission has recently amended this model code of conduct, whereby the election commission of India has prohibited political parties from releasing their manifesto in the last 48 hours leading up to voting in each phase of the coming Lok Sabha or Vidhan Sabha election. So any political party, if they have to release their election manifesto, then it must be done before 48 hours of the first phase of polling. And as already mentioned that this particular change has been made in part 8 of Model Code of Conduct, which deals with poll manifestos. So effectively, the Model Code of Conduct is comprised into eight parts. And these parts govern different aspects with respect to conduct of elections. Part 1 is about general conduct. Part 2 is about meetings. Part 3 is about processions. Part 4 is about polling day. Part 5 is about polling booth. Part 6 is about observers. Part 7 is about party in power. And part 8 is about guidelines on election manifesto. Now another important point which must be remembered is that with respect to observance of model code of conduct, it also applies to social media. So basically the government in power cannot use social media to further their political objective after the model code of conduct has come into effect. Now after understanding these basic facts about model code of conduct, let us go through some of the important aspect which has been highlighted in this particular news, especially with respect to conduct of election in Delhi. So the news reads that with the announcement of the dates of Delhi assembly elections, the model code of conduct has come into place. And this was announced by the chief electoral officer. In this regard, it says that all government departments have been instructed to take down political posters and images of political leaders from their websites and social media accounts within 24 hours of the MCC coming into effect. And in this regard, even the urban local bodies of Delhi have been instructed to enforce these provisions of Election Commission of India with respect to enforcement of model code of conduct. Now, another important aspect highlighted in this news is with respect to absentee voters. It says that persons with disabilities flagged on electoral roll and senior citizens above the age of 80 years across Delhi will have the facility to cast their vote as absentee voters and such persons who want to cast their vote as absentee voters need to file their applications with the respective returning officer within five days from the notification of the election which will be done on 14th January 2020. Now in this regard you must know about absentee ballot. It means or it refers to a vote cast by someone who is not able to go to the polling station. So with respect to Delhi, the election commission has ensured that people with disability and senior citizen above the age of 80 years will have the facility of absentee ballot. And in this regard, the election commission shall do all the necessary efforts which is required. 
However, if such persons want to avail this facility of absentee ballot, then they must file their applications with the respective returning officer within 5 days from the notification of election which will be done on 14th January 2020. So basically, the absentee voters must file their application from 14th January to 19th January 2020 in order to avail the facility of absentee ballot. Now this is done in order to increase voter turnout in any election which is very important for any democracy and in this regard the voters will have to fill form 12D. Now this news says that special teams will go door to door to reach out to such voters and voters will be issued postal ballot papers. So this aspect becomes important with respect to conduct of election in Delhi. For the voters of Delhi, they shall also have the facility to use digital voter slip as per the chief electoral officer. At such polling stations, mobile phones will be allowed inside the booth for QR code on the digital slip which shall be scanned and after that phones have to be deposited in a tray before these people cast their vote. So in this regard, the ECI also provides for digital photo voter slip and this can be downloaded from the voter helpline mobile app of election commission. Now this extract has been taken from the website of election commission which says that this experimental feature shall be available to those who link their EPIC number with mobile number. Now EPIC stands for electoral photo identity card. So the website of Election Commission of India highlights that to avail the facility of digital photo voter slip, the voters must link their electoral photo identity card with their mobile number. So this is another added feature which will be available during the elections in Delhi. Thus this news becomes important from the perspective of polity and governance from GS paper 2. With this, let's move on to our next news discussion. Now the next news which we have taken for our discussion appears on page number 11 from the archives. Now this archives today mentions about privy purse abolition. So in this backdrop it becomes important to know about privy purse abolition. So the question is first of all that what is privy purse? Now in India a privy purse was a payment made to the former princely states or the royal family as a part of arrangement for them to integrate within Indian territories. Now we know that when India got its independence in 1947, there were roughly more than 560 princely states. So in order to make these princely states join Indian territory, Privy Purse was sort of a settled offer whereby payment shall be made to these rulers by the government of India. Now this privy purse also becomes important because after the Indian Independence Act of 1947, this particular act gave these princely states the choice either to join India or to join Pakistan or to remain independent. So basically privy purse was sort of a consideration for these princely states to sign the treaty of accession with India. So on signing the instrument of accession, the government of India granted these princely states a privy purse which was a specified sum of money that was payable annually to the rulers of such states. However, the privy purse was abolished through Constitution 26th Amendment Act of 1971 and this was done by Mrs. Indira Gandhi when she was the Prime Minister of India. Now this becomes an important aspect from your prelims point of view. As in 2019, a question was asked with respect to 9th schedule and who was the Prime Minister of India. So in this backdrop, you must know that the Constitution 26th Amendment to abolish Privy Purse was initiated during the tenure of Mrs. Indira Gandhi as Prime Minister. Further, the payments of Privy Purse were made to these former rulers under the constitutional provisions of Article 291 and 362 of the Indian Constitution. However, this practice of Privy Purse was often questioned as a relic of the colonial past. Now this concept of Privy Purse basically conferred a special status to the 
ruling class and thereby it went against the concept of equality as well as an egalitarian society as prescribed in the indian constitution further privy purse was also seen as an added economic pressure on a newly born independent country which was ridden with poverty hunger and security challenges so in all these backdrop this concept of privy purse was abolished as a socialist and egalitarian measure through constitution 26th amendment act 1971 so in its statement of objects and reasons the constitution 26th amendment act 1971 states that the concept of rulership with privy purses and special privileges unrelated to any current functions and social purposes is incompatible with an egalitarian social order government have therefore decided to terminate the privy purses and privileges of the rulers of former indian states and in this regard it is necessary for this purpose apart from amending the relevant provisions of the constitution to insert a new article therein so as to terminate expressly the recognition already granted to such rulers and to abolish privy purses and extinguish all rights liabilities and obligations in respect of privy purses and accordingly the constitution 26th amendment act 1971 inserted article 363a in the indian constitution and in this regard article 363a read recognition granted to rulers of indian states to cease and privy purses to be abolished so with respect to privy purse you must remember that article 291 and 362 were omitted from the indian constitution and a new article was inserted namely article 363a in the indian constitution which not only ceased recognition granted to rulers of indian states but also abolished privy purses now it is important to note that even though government of india had agreed as a principle to give privy purses to these former princely states despite this fact previous prime ministers of india including jawahar lal nehru had expressed their dissatisfaction over the matter time and again so it says that following the 1967 elections indira gandhi supported the demand that government should abolish privy purses however this move of indira gandhi was opposed by murarji desai and he called this move morally wrong and amounting to a breach of faith with the princes so in this aspect you must remember that murarji desai did not support abolition of privy purses it further highlights that the government tried to bring a constitutional amendment in 1970 that is a year earlier but this was not passed in rajya sabha further it then issued an ordinance which was again struck down by the supreme court with respect to abolition of privy purses so effectively indira gandhi made this into a major election issue in 1971 and thereby got a lot of public support so after winning the election in 1971 indira gandhi abolished privy purse through constitution 26th amendment act 1971 now as mentioned earlier this was the question which was asked in the prelims of 2019 the question was the ninth schedule was introduced in the constitution of india during the prime ministership of now the ninth schedule of the indian constitution was added through constitution first amendment act and it was added during the prime ministership of jawahar lal nehru so similar questions can be asked with respect to privy purse as well as other initiatives taken during the reign of Mrs Indira Gandhi as prime minister of India so it says that Indira Gandhi led the congress party to victory in 1967 71 and 1980 general elections it further highlights that she is also credited with the slogan garibi hatao victory 1971 war and also for policy initiatives like abolition of privy purse nationalization of banks nuclear test and environmental protection Now this extract further highlights that Mrs Indira Gandhi was assassinated on 31st October 1984. So these basic facts becomes important from our prelims perspective especially with respect to abolition of privy purse in India. 
So after understanding the concept of privy purse, let's move on to our next news discussion. The next news appears on page number seven. It says state reverses decision on APMCs. Now this particular news is with respect to a specific state of Maharashtra, whereby the state cabinet has reversed the appointment of four technical experts in agricultural produce marketing committees. Now this news is a very state specific news. However, let us understand about agricultural produce marketing committees and the various problems faced by these marketing companies, which has also impacted Indian agriculture as a whole. As you can see, this particular question was asked in the mains examination of 2014 in GS paper 3. The question read, there is also a point of view that agricultural produce market committees set up under state acts have not only impeded the development of agriculture but also have been the cause of food inflation in India, critically examined. So we see that a straightforward question critically examining the purpose of agricultural produce market committees have been asked by UBSC. So in this backdrop, let us understand about agriculture produce marketing committees and the various problems which is being faced by these committees as of now in India. Now this topic becomes an important topic from the perspective of GS paper 3, especially under Indian economy as well as with respect to transport and marketing of agricultural produce and issues and also related constraints. Another important part of the syllabus becomes e-technology in the aid of farmers. Further, issues related to direct and indirect farm subsidies, minimum support price, as well as public distribution system objectives, functioning limitations, as well as revamping. So in this background, this topic on agricultural produce marketing committees becomes very important. Now, APMC is a statutory market committee constituted by respective state government as per their respective state APMC acts. Now the objective of these APMCs are to develop an efficient marketing system to market agricultural produce, to promote agricultural processing and agricultural exports and also to specify procedures as well as systems to establish an effective infrastructure for the marketing of agricultural produce. Essentially Indian agriculture can be seen to be consisting of two distinct components that is production as well as post production activities. Now production activities in agriculture includes cultivation of agricultural crops whereas post production activities relates to marketing related activities of such agricultural produce. Now with respect to agricultural production, India has not only made rapid progress since independence with respect to agricultural production but has also become self-sufficient in foods as well as as a net exporter of agricultural products. As of now, India is one of the top producers of cereals, pulses, fruits, vegetables, milk, meat and marine fish. However, we have not made equal progress with respect to post-production capabilities. So in this aspect, the post-production activities of Indian agriculture has not kept pace with respect to agricultural production since independence. And in this regard, the agricultural marketing in India still continues to remain outdated. Hence, in spite of record production of agricultural commodities, the farmers are not able to get remunerative prices on their agricultural produce. Further, this problem has got manifested in the form of agrarian distress and increase in farmers' suicide. The increase in the instances of dumping of agricultural produce such as tomatoes, potatoes, milk, etc. on the roads by farmers highlight the urgency to carry out reforms in the agricultural marketing in India. So in this regard, the rapid growth of Indian agricultural production in India calls for a paradigm shift in the post-production capabilities of Indian system. The earlier marketing system in India 
was set up in order to cater to the shortfall in agricultural production and was accordingly geared for more price controls. However, since production scenario in India has got changed, the agricultural marketing policies now should also change accordingly. So in the backdrop of change from the concept of price control to that of catering post-production of agricultural commodities, let us understand the role of agricultural marketing in India. Agricultural marketing in India has a much broader connotation and basically includes all activities in the procurement process of farm inputs by the farmers. Further, it also includes the movement of agricultural produce from the farmland to the end consumers including industries as well as traders. Now this movement from farmland to the end consumers goes through a number of process including the agricultural produce marketing committees. Further, this movement from farmland to end consumers entails a number of activities such as storage of farm produce, physical handling of such farm produce, transportation, primary processing, grading and packaging and finally selling of such farm produce to its end consumers, industries or traders. So we can say agricultural marketing involves all the aspects related to agriculture while excluding the core activity of cultivation. So we understand that an efficient agricultural marketing system is extremely important for the growth of agriculture sector in India on account of number of reasons. So effectively we can say that there is a need for an efficient agricultural marketing in India for the following reasons. Namely, first, an efficient and well-connected agricultural marketing enables the farmers to buy agricultural inputs such as fertilizers at affordable prices. Now buying agricultural inputs at affordable prices becomes very important as agricultural input costs have been increasing over a period of time. Secondly, it provides signals to the farmers with respect to planning for sowing of crops. By making use of market signals, the farmers would be able to grow those crops which are high in demand and thereby get remunerative prices. Further, a well-connected and an efficient market would also be able to address the food inflation since it would be able to match the supply with that of demand. And additionally, announcement of MSP by the government will also help the farmers in knowing which crop to sow in a particular season. Thirdly, an integrated domestic marketing system would considerably reduce price variations of agricultural commodities in the market. Now this would enable farmers to sell their produce anywhere in India without much of price fluctuations thereby getting best prices for their produce. Now a high level expert committee was constituted by Ministry of Agriculture and it has estimated that around 25 to 30 percent of fruits and vegetable and around 8 to 10 percent of food grains get wasted due to inadequate storage facilities. Further, food grains are wasted annually as well due to lack of post-harvest technology and non-existence of integrated transport, storage and marketing facilities. So in this regard, an effective marketing infrastructure would enable the farmers to reduce their post-harvest losses, thereby improving their farm income. And lastly, there is a lot of scope for India to boost its export of agricultural commodities However, India has failed to make optimum utilization of this particular opportunity. So, considering all these aspects, the agricultural marketing policies can act as an enabler for boosting agricultural exports. So, after understanding the need for an efficient agricultural marketing in India, let us understand the problems with 
agricultural marketing in india now the agricultural marketing continues to face multifaceted challenges and problems in india now it's important to understand that when india adopted lpg reforms in 1991 it was expected that agricultural marketing would also be liberalized in the same manner however the government failed to bring out any significant reforms with respect to agricultural marketing in tune with the then changed environment of lpg the agricultural marketing still continues to be plagued by problems such as fragmented supply chain poor marketing infrastructure higher post production losses and also there is a lack of timely information system with respect to agricultural produce in different warehouses so considering these aspects let us look into the problems affecting the agricultural marketing in india now the first problem is with respect to regulation of markets now under the present apmc act only the state governments are permitted to set up markets the act requires that farm produce to be sold only at regulated markets through registered intermediaries further the essential commodities act allows central and state governments to place restrictions on storage and movement of commodities deemed essential by the government so such kind of regulations has stifled the private sector investment in agricultural marketing infrastructure further such restrictions also create artificial barriers and unnecessarily hinder free flow of agricultural commodities in india thus the focus of the government so far has been on regulating these markets rather than facilitating agricultural trade so effectively the government must start focusing on facilitating agricultural trade rather than regulating these agricultural market now with respect to fragmented agricultural marketing in india there are around 2500 regulated apmcs and around 5000 sub market yards regulated by respective agricultural produce marketing committees in india apart from that there are thousands of rural markets or gramin hards hence due to this fragmented marketing infrastructure for agricultural produce the agricultural commodities pass through multiple middlemen and traders who operate in apmc this effectively leads to escalation in the cost of prices of agricultural produce and effectively prevents the farmers from getting remunerative prices hence the government must focus to reduce these middlemen at different levels operating at different apmcs and ideally the farmers should be allowed to sell their produce anywhere throughout india based on prices which they get as allowing farmers to sell their produce anywhere in india will significantly improve their bargaining position and enable them to earn more income so in this regard the present fragmented marketing infrastructure goes against the very interest of both farmers as well as consumers so in this regard there is a need to develop an integrated domestic market by removing all existing agricultural trade related barriers now with respect to lack of access to apmcs adequate number of markets should be set up closer to agricultural fields by respective state government as this will give farmers more access to apmcs this will also lead to decrease in transportation cost for the farmers and cut down post harvest losses now in this regard the national commission for farmers has recommended that each apmc should serve a market area of around 80 square kilometer and it should be made available to farmers within a radius of 5 kilometers however as of now an average apmc in india serves as an area of around 450 square kilometer as against to the recommendation of 80 square kilometer and this aspect denotes higher transportation cost and higher post harvest losses for the farmers so on this account farmers are forced to sell their produce at a lower price outside the apmcs because of huge transportation cost and also because of greater distance 
from the farm so the government must ensure that there is adequate access to farmers to their nearest apmcs now another point highlighted is with respect to the fact that agricultural marketing practices in india is against the interest of small and marginal farmers almost 85% of the farmers in india are small and marginal and hence these farmers who have lower farm income find it difficult to aggregate their produce and sell it to apmcs through auction so these farmers end up selling their produce to local agents and traders at much lower prices and hence they are not able to get remunerative income which they should have got if they have sold their produce in apmcs so as of now agricultural marketing in india is acting against the interest of small and marginal farmers which accounts for roughly 85% of indian farmers now another point highlighted is with respect to poor infrastructure of apmcs now poor infrastructure of apmcs leads to improper storage and consequently higher post harvest losses further most of the apmcs have not been able to set up electronic auction platforms which are quite important for offering remunerative prices to the farmers thus infrastructure development of apmcs in line with modern technologies it the utmost need of the hour now with respect to imposition of multiple fees by apmc these apmcs charges market fee from the buyers and licensee fee from traders as well as different agents such as loading agents warehousing agents etc and these multiple fees are estimated to be around 15% of the value of agricultural produce and this also adds up to the cost of final agricultural prices and adversely affects the end consumers so the government needs to reset these different imposition of multiple fees by apmcs and finally with respect to higher post harvest losses according to a recent study the total estimate loss in india is around 92000 crore rupees the higher post harvest losses could be attributed to fragmented market lack of access to proper storage poor handling as well as transportation thus addressing the problems with agricultural marketing will ultimately end up addressing the issue of storage of farm produce physical handling transportation primary processing as well as grading and packaging of these farm produce and all these will ultimately help in providing the farmer adequate or remunerative prices for their produce and this will also significantly help the farmers in increasing their farm income so these are some of the problems with agricultural marketing in india and these can be said to be the probable solution which the state governments needs to look into thus this topic with respect to apmc becomes very important from our examination perspective the next news appears on page number 1 it says government projects slower gdp growth 5% estimate in line with rbi forecast now recently the national statistical office that is nso released the first advanced gdp estimates for the financial year 2019-20 the real gdp growth rate has been said to be at 5% for 2019-20 and nominal gdp growth rate has been said to be at 7.53% and this nominal growth rate of 7.53% is considered to be lowest since 1975-76 further this is also the first time since 2002 2003 that nominal gdp growth has been in single digits further with respect to this manufacturing has grown at 2% as compared to the previous year of 6.9% and construction has grown at 3.2% as compared to the previous year of 8.7% so we see a sheer decline with respect to growth in india so after understanding these statistical information let us understand the basics with respect to real gdp and nominal gdp 
Now, real GDP refers to GDP at base year prices and the base year prices is taken from the year 2011-2012 and it is calculated as per the market prices in that base year. Whereas the nominal GDP refers to GDP at current market prices that is GDP calculated as per the market prices for the year for which GDP is calculated. So it takes into account inflation in the economy whereas real GDP negates inflation in goods as well as services. Now if the inflation in an economy is high then the nominal GDP would be quite higher as compared to the real GDP. However, if there is deflation in the economy, then in such a situation, the real GDP will be higher as compared to nominal GDP. So these become some of the important basics with respect to real GDP and nominal GDP, where nominal GDP takes inflation into account and real GDP which is calculated at base year prices negates inflation in the economy. Now with respect to GDP deflator, it measures overall inflation in goods and services within an economy and it is calculated as per this formula of nominal GDP divided by real GDP into 100. Another important aspect to be noted is that the GDP in India is estimated by National Statistical Office which works under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. So these can be said to be some of the important basics with respect to real as well as nominal GDP. Moving further, let us understand the implications of such a low growth rate in India. Now first implication is with respect to decrease in tax collection. Now the Indian economy is said to register the lowest nominal GDP growth rate since 1975-76. And it is pertinent to note that the lower nominal GDP growth rate will also translate into lower tax collections for the government. Hence, the government needs to work on to increase its revenue sources. The next implication is with respect to breach of fiscal target by the government. Now you must understand that there are four drivers of growth, namely private consumption, government expenditure, investment and exports and except government expenditure all other drivers of growth have witnessed a decline that is there has been a decline in private consumption investment as well as exports so the present economic slowdown has in turn put pressure on the government's different sources of revenues so going forward the government may find it difficult to sustain its higher expenditure on because of lack of revenue sources and hence government might not be able to meet its fiscal deficit target of 3.3% of GDP. Now further, the single digit growth rate of nominal GDP would also translate into lower profit for companies and this will have two adverse impacts that is first of all it will reduce their investment expenditure and secondly, it will also result in slow increase in salary of employees and this will ultimately see decline in consumption expenditure. As less money is credited to people's account, they will end up spending less and they will end up saving more and this will eventually lead to decrease in investment as well as consumption expenditure in the economy. The next point highlighted with respect to implication is failure of government's policies. Now in the recent past, both the central government as well as Reserve Bank have taken number of measures to revive the Indian economy. For instance, the government reduced corporate tax and took various reforms to boost exports. Whereas the RBI ended up reducing repo rates to the account of 135 basis points. So despite adding so much money in the economy, there is still lack of growth in the Indian economy and this is a cause of concern. And also the fact that all these measures taken by government and RBI have collectively failed to revive the Indian economy. Hence, we can say that there has been a failure of government's previous policies. The next implication is with respect to global challenges as 
the release of first advance estimate comes at the backdrop of growing volatility in international politics now already the indian economy was facing the onslaught of trade war and rising protectionism and now this problem has further compounded amid growing tensions between iran and united states now the escalation of conflict will have an impact in west asia and this will also lead to increase in international crude oil prices and this will in turn put pressure on india's trade deficit leading to rise in or increase in india's current account deficit so all these aspects must be kept in mind when the indian finance minister present her budget in the next month and the whole focus of the government must be to revive these drivers of growth including rural demand thus this topic becomes important from our economy point of view and questions can be asked in your prelims as well as mains examination with respect to the current state of indian economy the next news appears on page number 9 it says it is up to states to provide 10% quota to economic and weaker sections of the society now this news highlights that the central government has informed the supreme court that it would be the state's prerogative to provide 10% economic reservation in government jobs and admission to education institutions now in this backdrop it's important to note that the ews quota was introduced through constitution 103rd amendment act and provides 10% reservation to members of economically weaker sections of the society and for this new provisions has been added in the indian constitution as article 15 clause 6 and article 16 clause 6 so in this backdrop let us go through some of the important points of the constitution 103rd amendment act of 2019 so the constitution 103rd amendment act of 2019 provides 10% reservation which shall be over and above the existing 50% reservation which is currently enjoyed by members of scheduled caste scheduled tribes as well as other backward classes so effectively this has taken the total reservation to 60% now this is one aspect which has been challenged in the supreme court of india now this reservation of 10% for ews members is targeted to include such members who do not avail benefits of reservation and this also includes members of minority communities including muslims sikhs buddhist christian and other communities who do not enjoy any kind of reservation now the government has put out certain criteria to ensure that which people will get this benefit of economically weaker section of the society for getting a reservation of 10% it says it says that persons whose family has gross annual income of less than rupees 8 lakh per annum now here you must understand that this amount of rupees 8 lakh per annum is for gross family income next person who possesses less than 5 acres of land a person who has agricultural land of less than 5 acre who has a house smaller than 1000 square feet who lives in a municipality and has a residential plot smaller than 100 yards and for those who live in a non notified municipality who has a residential plot of less than 200 yards another important point to be noted is that economically weaker sections of the society shall be notified by different state governments from time to time and this will be done on the basis of family income and other indicators of economic disadvantage so basically state governments can also come up with their own set of criteria to give reservation under ews as already mentioned the constitution 103rd amendment act 2019 has introduced article 15 clause 6 and article 16 clause 6 so let's go through the important provisions of both these articles now as we already know that article 15 of the constitution prohibits discrimination against any citizen on grounds of race religion caste sex or place of birth however as per article 154 the government may make any special provision for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes 
and it is here where the constitution 103rd amendment act has added article 15 clause 6 whereby a state can make any special provision for the advancement of any economically weaker sections of the citizens which the state is free to regulate next state can make any special provision for the advancement of economically weaker sections of citizens with respect to admission to educational institutions including private educational institutions whether aided or unaided by state so this reservation shall also apply to private educational institutions which are either aided or unaided by the state however this particular reservation of 10% shall not be applicable to minority educational institutions now this become an important aspect to remember from your prelims point of view next reservation to such educational institution will be in addition to the existing reservation and subject to a maximum of 10%. So basically reservation under EWS has been capped at 10% and this is over and above the existing 50% reservation. Now article 16 provides for prohibition of discrimination in employment in any government office. So hereby the constitution 103rd amendment act has inserted article 16 clause 6 whereby the state may make any provision for the reservation of appointments or post in favor of any economically weaker sections of the citizens in addition to existing reservation and subject to a maximum of 10%. So effectively, reservation of 10% to members of EWS shall be provided in educational institution as well as in public employment. Now after our discussion, these forms your practice question number 1 and practice question number 2. First, consider the following statements. Model code of conduct comes into effect on the date of notification of election by election commission of India. Now this statement is incorrect as it comes into effect the day on which election schedule is announced by the election commission. Second, model code of conduct prohibits political parties from releasing their manifestos in the last 72 hours leading up to voting from first phase of polling. No, this is incorrect as the correct answer would be 48 hours. So the question is, which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So both the statements are incorrect, hence the correct answer is C. Question number 2. Which of the statements about Privy Purse is are correct? First, Privy Purse acted as a consideration for rulers of former Indian princely states to sign treaty of accession with India. Yes, this is correct. Second, Constitution 26th Amendment Act 1971 abolished Privy Purse in India. Yes, this is correct. Third, Privy Purse was abolished during the tenure of Mrs. Indira Gandhi as Prime Minister. Yes, this is also correct. So the question is, select the correct answer using the code given below. So the correct answer is D, that is 1, 2 and 3. Now moving on to question number 3. It says, which of the following can be said to be bottlenecks for growth of agricultural marketing in India? Options are, fragmented agriculture supply chain. Yes, this is correct. Second, lack of access to APMCs for marginal farmers. Yes, this is also correct. Third, poor infrastructure of warehousing facilities for agricultural produce. Yes, this is also correct. And fourth, domestic trade barriers in agriculture. Yes, this is also correct. The question is, select the correct answer using the code given below. So the correct answer is D, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Question number 4. Consider the following statements. First, real GDP growth rate is calculated at base year prices and takes inflation into account. No, it does not take inflation into account. Second, nominal GDP growth rate is calculated at current market prices but does not take inflation into account. No, nominal GDP growth rate takes inflation into account. So the question is, which of the statements given above is are incorrect? So here again, both statements are incorrect. So the correct answer is C, that is both 1 and 2. With this, we come to an end to discussion of today's newspaper. Let's move on to the question for the day. 